Germans. Very strange to even be hearing Germans spoken in a synagogue in America. Perhaps it's not. Today we're going to learn a little bit more about that. Um, but I want to start to use the first sort of 15 minutes to give us a little orientation about what it is we're going to be doing during our service. Then we're going to be having our service. And then our Bill Korn is the president of the Temple Israel of Bethel Foundation with whom I, he and I have been just so excited speaking because of our research. will share with us more specifically about this community um, in this day. So I wanted to begin um, by, uh, that was choir music. That was the song, Ma Tovu. Who here knows Ma Tovu? This is the Ma Tovu that you would have heard uh, probably around 1900. And it's very different than what we're used to hearing in the style we're used to. Now I want to begin by asking, who has been to this synagogue before? Raise your hand. Okay. Who has grandparents that came over before 1800? Before 1800? Yes, 1800. Yeah, okay. who has grandparents or relatives, I should say, who came over before 1880? Okay, those of you who came over before 1880, may I ask those of you who are Jewish, uh, or, or whose ancestors were Jewish, no outing anybody who may not have been, um, where did they come from? Oh, very unusual, very unusual for this, I guess. Germany. Germany, who else? Germany, okay. And who had relatives that came over after, like, starting the 1890 or 1900 onward? Okay, and where did your relatives come from? Russia. Okay, so what we're going to talk about a little bit during my sermon, okay, is I want you to think about three periods of time. There's the revolutionary and colonial period of time, and that was actually dominated um, by the Sephardic rituals and traditions. You may not know what that means, but we'll get into that. But think Spain, Brazil, um, Dutch, and everything was done in the style of the Sephardic tradition. And if your relatives came over in 1800, chances were even if they were for Germany, they would daven and blend in with that Ashkenazi, that Sephardic tradition. The 1800s, I'm going to call, this is also general, the period of, I call it the German period. And the 1900s, that's when my ancestors came, they were uneducated, they all went to Ellis Island, I never even went west until I met Tom, my husband. Um, they were very much situated in the East Coast, Texas, there was a movement, but this period that we're in, is going to be the late 1800s. We're going to look at that more during my sermon about the services that would have been conducted then. So I want to ask, um, in, a, in a way that would have never been done, because one of the things that was very important back then was, it's hard to believe because this is the unions in the Bronx, but propriety. And the community really had the minister, they called the rabbi or the leader. And it was much more formal. But I want you to look around and maybe call out a few things that you notice about this space, um, this physical space, the things that you see or notice. Arches. Arches, okay, yep, uh huh. What else? Gothic arches. Gothic arches, uh huh, what else? A balcony, wonderful, okay. Balcony, what else? Stars. What's that? Stars on the wall. Okay. Uh huh. More? Anything else? The uh, the Star David up there. Um, mm -hmm. there. Star David. Yeah. What else? The shade of the Moorish windows. Ah, interesting. Moorish windows. Mm -hmm. What else? So all of this is. It's, what's so interesting is what was noticed and what we don't know. So somebody mentioned the balcony. One of the things you'll see is. That balcony was really radical in its day. That was not a balcony that held women. That was a balcony that held a choir. Number two, no one commented on this thing. 
The organ, and we'll hear more about that, was the instrument of the 1800s in America in a, not just reform settings, conservative orthodox. And this was um, the organ and then the choir were the primary modalities of the music. What about where you're seated? Very Pews! Pews! Um, these were called family pews. This is radical. You know why it's radical? <coughs> Who said that? Yes, thank you. Men and women sat together. That was radical in the 1800s. Started. It was not done in for those of us who were from the Eastern European era. This was radical um, as well. Um, right now, I've chosen not to wear anything on my head. Back then, most people, uh, Jews who were in the synagogue, would not have won a head covering. They would not have one worn either a prayer shawl. We'll get into that. Um, they also, um, a radical thing would have been the rabbi's sermon. So at a synagogue at the summit, the board when I first started working was like, you're going to give sermons all the time. Back in the old country, before we came to America, the rabbi gave two sermons a year. That was it. Yes, we would have liked that. Which was the Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and on Shabbat Hagadol, which is the Shabbat right before Passover. The innovation of having a rabbi sermon was very much influenced by our Protestant neighbors and the fact that that's what they were doing. Um, so I'm going to ask. Um, ah. And I want to add one thing, and then we'll talk more about my notes a little bit later. Um, we are in a very um, unique situation in talking with Bill. So what did this service look like? I would say it's unclear whether this community actually probably did not have one prayer book at all. And in the early 1800s, what you would have found is Jews were coming together, very much like SOS did, lay people. And the lay people organized and began synagogues. These were lay people generally back in the mid-1800s who did not go to university, who did not go to rabbinical school, but they gathered as Jews and they would often have a lay leader lead services. Sound familiar? And they organized often around starting around a holiday. Guess what holiday was usually when they said we need to have a, a community? Rosh Hashanah! So that is when they came together. And it was only later that we'll get into it that there was the rise of what we'll talk more about, but called the um, Minhag America. But um, during my sermon, but this is what we're going to be using. And this prayer book from 1895 was put together. I'm going to share more about it during the sermon. But I'm asking you to imagine yourselves back in time. Where going to a synagogue, what mattered to you was a sense of decorum. Decorum, <coughs> you were an immigrant, elevated English was very important to you. Very important. And people like Susan Green would have been thrilled because most Jews didn't know Hebrew. And so, guess who was doing all the talking in Hebrew, if any? The prayer leader. That was it. It was English, English, English. And as we go through this, if you are struck by how untraditional this is, I will let you know that there were many congregations in America that refused to use this. They thought it was too traditional. They thought it was too traditional. So we will get there. But um, I'll end, and then uh, Aviv and I are going to change into the garb that used to be worn during the day and uh, share that there's a famous Midrash. And the Midrash is God is talking to Moses, and he takes Moses on a journey through time, kind of like that one about the um, movie about was it Christmas, and what his life would have been like if he wasn't there. Do you know that one? It's a wonderful life. It's a thank you, Myra. It's a wonderful life. So God takes Moses about 500 years, 600, 
thousand years into the future, and there's these men sitting around tables, and they're staring down at some sort of a book, and they're wearing weird clothing. They're not wearing desert sandals and you know flowing robes, and they're pointing at the book and they're arguing. And Moses is like, "What is this?" And God said, "This is the Jewish community." And Moses like, "What? Like I was wandering around the book. What are you talking about?" Because what do you know? All those little crowns on the Torah and all of those spaces, that gave room. And they stepped in and evolved Judaism. And this is Judaism today. So what I'm going to say is we're going to go back the other way. And kind of go back and see what Judaism was like in the 1890s. And I ask us, we'll talk more about it when we have it more in context, to have an open mind. It's very easy to judge and judge negatively. But I invite you just to think about what do you notice, what do you feel, how is it different, and we'll talk uh, more about that. So as we're about to begin, I ask you...